Welcome back to the beehive. Let's go up and see what's going on up there. I've got some things to share. I've unpacked from retreat. I do have a pile of quilts to bind that I quilted at retreat and I've started my design wall layout figuring what I have to do next I'm looking forward to putting some things together but the priority is this quilt right here I made this for my sister for her birthday and I am actually flying up in about a week and a half and so I need to get this wall hanging layered and quilted. I took a really cute little wonderful sashiko block which I used two different colors of blue and then I used a variety of scraps from my stash and I created this large hexi quilt. So today we are going to layer and quilt this quilt. Stay tuned! The first thing I have to do though before I can layer my quilt because I use fusible batting is to clean my iron. My iron at retreat got some fusible um, stuck on it on the plate and so it needs to be cleaned and I am going to clean it with this iron clean. They're like they're kind of like dryer sheets. That's what they remind me of. So let's see how that works. So you can see the sheets are like dryer sheets and it's by bonash.com. I got this at Joann's and I usually keep a couple packs around because there's nothing like getting a sticky iron when you're ready to do some ironing. So we're going to see how this works. It takes a hot dry iron so I've heated my iron up and now I'm going to run my iron over this sheet. Oh my gosh, look at how pristine that looks. Neat! This is an easy, better than the paste because you don't have to deal with the paste. These are just the bone ash Clean your iron dryer sheets. Looks brand new. Now on to piecing a batting for my wall hanging. I'm going to use a, a baby uh, batting. The crib size is 45 by 60, which is absolutely perfect for this wall hanging. I get these heirloom fusible battings on sale from Fabric Depot when I'm in Portland, but I know that you can mail order them also. So I'm going to now get my backing ready and then we're going to layer. So now I'm ready. I'm going to, I press my back, got the, it cut to the appropriate size. Now I'm going to use this fusible baby batting and it comes kind of it's a little bit on the sticky side and it has some wrinkles and you kind of have to peel it apart because it has got the fusible on it but because I have asthma this is the type of I can't use the uh, 505 that uh, my girlfriend Cakers can use which um, she really enjoys so if you don't have asthma and you want to um, use a fusible, make your batting fusible, you can use the 505 product. It comes in a can. 
this is what I'm doing. So I kind of peeled it all apart, get as many of the, uh, get all the big wrinkles out, and then I'm going to line it up because I know that I measured my quilt top and I know that it is the perfect size for this wall hanging. And this is going to be for my sister over her bed. She had a, a blank space over her bed, but she lives in Napa, California, and they occasionally will have an earthquake, and my brother-in-law does not want to have any heavy picture hanging over the bed. So I thought this would be perfect. So now I'm going to line this up. Make sure that I have it enough of the back on there. It looks like I have to move it over a little bit. There and there. Good. So now I know I just have to get the wrinkle out. I'm getting Fitbit points by doing this. <laughs> I swear. When I've got my grandson and I'm bouncing him around, my Fitbit is picking up all that activity. Okay, so now I can start fusing the batting. Now, the, the interesting thing about this fusible batting is it doesn't leave sticky residue on your iron. I have not had that problem, but I do try to not hover over an uncovered piece of the batting. I'm loving my uh, new iron, and with this um, iron, the habit that you have to break is that you just can't set your iron like this like you do normal. You have to set it back on the dock when you're readjusting a piece or um, you know, taking a break, you just set it back on the dock. Okay, so now I'm going to just pick it all up and move it down. And as I'm smoothing this out, I'm feeling for wrinkles in the batting. And I feel kind of a big wrinkle here, so what I do is I pull this back and I take a look at it. Get that wrinkle out. And bring this back over. Get my Fitbit points. And then I continue ironing. So I now have ironed the top, and I think we should. Uh, so far today, I have 2,485. Fitbit points since this morning. So I'm going to flip this over and iron the back and make sure there's no wrinkles and let's check how many points ironing gives you. Now when you flip it over, don't freak out that there's a bunch of wrinkles because we're going to straighten those all out. We're going to smooth it out and you can peel this up. We know that the front is down secure. And so now we're going to iron the back and make sure it looks nice also for quilting. And, and this looks fabulous. 
Stay tuned for the next step. We're going to start quilting on the Sweet 16. So now I'm quilting my wall hanging on my HQ Sweet 16, which I love. Uh, the reason I love it is that I have a good visual. But there are certain things that you need to know about um, quilting. You need good gloves. Some people use garden gloves with the little nubbies on them, but I need them a little more fitted, so I have bought these uh, Fonz and Porter gloves um, at my uh, local quilt store, The Stitch and Post, here in Sisters. And uh, they're different sizes, and these fit perfectly, and so they really help take the pressure off my neck and my shoulders. The second tool you need for quilting is a good bra. Depending on the size bra you wear, you want to have some protection because you might have a workplace hazard, you know, so you want to sit up straight, drop your shoulders, move your neck around every so often, take a sip of coffee, actually cappuccino. Mmm, really good. And then you start stitching. Now I'm stitching in the ditch around all of this uh, quilt uh, to kind of anchor it and to make it uh, easier just to quilt later and not worry about any shifting. The thing you have to know about stitching in the ditch is you have to look at it like driving. You know, you're given a lane on a highway and you might move a little bit this or that way, but as long as you stay in the lane, that's okay. There is no perfection in stitching in the ditch. So if you deviate from the ditch, that's okay as long as you basically stay in your lane. And so I'm going to continue with my stitching in the ditch. I started in the center and am now moved out, and I have two more rows to go on one end. And then we get to the fun part, which is stitching the motifs in the design. The best part of this quilt is it's going to look awesome because it's going to a non-quilter. They don't know. They don't know a thing. So they're going to look at it. My sister's going to look at it and think it's beautiful. Even if I deviated from the lane a little bit. So here I go. I try to continue with um, do as much of a continuation where I don't have to start and stop a lot, but I don't sweat it. If I have to back over a seam, I am backing up. It does not matter to me because it's not going to show. Constantly readjusting my quilt so there's no drag. got all my cross hatching done and now I'm ready to decide on the quilting motifs for each of the hexes and the easiest way for me to decide on that is to go to my Pinterest site which I have um, and you can follow my Pinterest it is um, divided into very usable topics this one being quilting motifs and I kind of already decided when I brought up those quilting motifs which one I might want to do. I don't want to do a lot of marking. So I just need to find the center of this hexi 
and draw a circle. So I measured with my ruler and found out this is 8 inches and put a center dot and then I took my little circles and I'm using this 1 and 18 inch one and I just drew a circle so that's the only marking I'm going to do and let's see if I can duplicate with just that one little mark a quilting motif did with my scissors. Hmm. I don't want to spend the time marking and so I'm using my ruler as a guide. This circle guide has, um, G told me, which I didn't realize, has some hashtag marks around the circle. So I made my dot in the center of the hexagon, and then I'm lining up these little marks to make sure that circle's in the center. He knows about this because he used to be a cartographer who drew maps. So I'm going to just make my circle. So this is the only marking I'm doing. So I know that when I do my loops, I'm just going to go as far down as the outside portion of that circle, and then it'll give me a nice consistent center. Just brush the chalk mark away and I have this little flower. Welcome back. My absolute favorite time to quilt is early in the morning before the rest of the world has gotten up. And I actually think my quilting is better when I'm in my PJs and bralas because it's just the freedom of free motion quilting just kind of channels through me to the quilt. But yesterday ended on a crazy note. Um, my little circle maker that I used to mark the center of my hexes, I actually sewed this to the back of my quilt. I mean you can see the the well maybe you can't see it but I actually punctured it with the Sweet 16 and had to unpick my my circle maker. <laughs> that was not ugly. That, 
that was not video worthy. But but we survived and it was it was free. So I am all over half done with this quilt. And once I am uh, done all the way, I'm going to show you how I'm going to face it because I'm not going to bind it in a traditional quilt way. I'm going to do some facing on it. But I don't know if you can see the quilting. It's really cool. It's turning out really cool. Very simple design in the hexes and just a tri uh, you know triangle in the triangles. And I'm doing a quarter inch seam using my ruler because I don't want to spend a lot of time marking everything. It's amazing how, as a quilter, you can kind of eyeball a quarter inch seam. gonna go to this next one. I'm gonna find the center of my hexi and make a little dot. Use my circle maker to find the center and make a circle around there just as a guide. Okay, and here we go. So now I'm reaching the finishing point of this quilt that I'm making for my sister. I finished all of the quilting on my Sweet 16 and that was just so comfortable and lickety split. And now I'm ready to do that final step. And that's where another choice came in. Sometimes, I mean a lot of times, you just go ahead and bind a quilt. But there are just certain quilts that lend themselves to what's called facing. And I think that's more like the modern or an Asian, a more simple look. It is not any simpler than actually attaching a binding, but um, it gives the quilt an entirely different look. So my go-to book for facing um, is Sylvia Pippin's book on Paradise Stitched. There is a, a little a couple pages on how to face a quilt and it's very simple. I um, trimmed my entire uh, piece down to the edge and then um, I then measure, you're going to attach the two sides first. So your strips are going to be three inches wide and then the length of your sides and you attach both sides first and then you do the top and the bottom. So right now I'm going to attach a side and I'm going to use about, I'm going to eyeball a quarter inch seam with my walking foot because we have many layers. The backing, the um, the batting, and then the pieced top. So I have already measured that strip three inches wide by the length of the side. attached my uh, three inch wide piece of facing fabric. 
See that? And now I'm going to press it away. That was right sides together. So it almost looks like a little border. The next step, which is very important, is to sew the, an eighth inch seam from the edge of your seam here, where your facing fabric was attached. So now I'm going to sew from the top. And I'm just going to kind of eyeball an eighth of an inch. And what this is going to do is to help that facing piece flip over. Now we go back to the ironing board. and we've got a nice hot iron. I put the right side down on my ironing board and now I'm going to pull this over and I'm just going to take that hot iron and press. Well actually what I'd like to do first because I always want a shortcut is I'm going to fold this under and make myself a little stitching seam. So I'm just going to Make this lickety split so I don't have to do it as I'm sewing. It'll already be ready to stitch down. You see how fast that was. Now I'm going to bring this over and I'm going to pull it all the way so that the whole facing goes to the back. Then to just keep it tugged there, I'm going to pin it so that my next step will be to stitch this facing down by hand stitching it along here. So. I'll just hold that down so that when I'm stitching along I don't have to keep readjusting it. So, 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 so. What will happen is I'm going to stitch this edge down like I would stitch a binding and then I'll take the pins out and then this is what the edge will look like. It won't have any binding per se. The whole quilt will be ready for presentation and this, all of this procedure can be found in Paradise Stitched by Sylvia Pippin. Once I stitch down both sides then you do the same process for the top and the bottom. The only difference is that you're going to make that strip a half an inch bigger on either end. Because when you flip it over, you're going to have to tuck that in to make it nice and clean on the back. So it'll come over this way. When it's all said and done, it will look like this quilt over here. So this whole quilt has been faced. No binding and you can see how I hand stitched it by flipping it over. Now you really have to do that eighth inch seam as the second step because it makes that facing fold right over. But it gives it an entirely different look than a regular binding. So there you go. 
Another project in the can. Talk to you later.